USA News and World Report, the latest edition, has an amazing article. It, it is entitled, the front cover is entitled, USA News World Report. This is December 19, Waiting for the Messiah. It's not talking about when Jesus came, of course, the first time. It's talking about the widespread belief around the world that Jesus is going to come again. Of course, this is not a religious magazine. This is about as secular as you can get. I want you to notice the cover again. It has a picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it has a picture of Jesus as a baby, but it's entitled, Waiting for the Messiah. I want to read you a portion of this wonderful article. It's entitled, The Christmas Covenant. Was Jesus' birth part of a divine plan leading to a golden age? Scholars are re-examining the biblical prophecies. The Advent season in church tradition is a time of sacred anticipation as Christians prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, in a Bethlehem stable. For believers through the ages, the joy of Advent lay in their understanding of that humble birth as a divine promise fulfilled, the swaddled baby in the manger as the long-awaited Messiah. But for many Christians, the comforting images of the Christmas season are linked to another more mysterious prophecy, that of the apocalyptic second coming of Christ. Ancient liturgies and modern Advent observances alike point to the promised return of Jesus in what many Christians believe will be a cataclysmic event that will end history and inaugurate a divine kingdom on earth. Belief in an apocalyptic end to history is by, mo by no means limited to the religious fringe. A new USA News poll has found that nearly 60% of Americans think the world will end sometime in the future. Almost a third of those who think it will end, uh, uh, I'm sorry, almost a third of those think it will end within a few decades. And more than 61% say they believe in the second coming of Christ. It is amazing that around the world, among not millions now, but billions of people, there is a growing conviction that something tremendous is about to burst upon the human race. Millions have the conviction that God is about to intervene and that Christ is about to return. Did you know that before Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, Around the Roman Empire, the then known world, there was a tremendous conviction shared by multitudes of people that the Messiah was about to come. Some of those folks were students of the Bible. Others were not students of the Bible. The very reason that the three wise men came from the East was because they were philosophers who had studied their own literature and who knew something of the prophecies of the Bible. And they were representative of a tremendous class of people who had a burning conviction that God was about to intervene in the history of the world. And he did. And I want you to know this today that around this world there are multitudes of people with the same burning conviction right now that Jesus is going to come again. It's made it to the front, the cover of USA News and World Report. Jesus is coming again. The purpose of our meeting this morning is this. To answer these questions, how will he return? How will Jesus return? And what great events will usher in his coming back to planet Earth? I want you to take your Bibles now as we talk about the coming of Jesus, the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17, and there are Bibles in the pews. 
First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. It is page 837 in the Bible. And today we're using the New International Version, which is readable, accurate. It is the Word of God, and you'll be blessed. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. This is the verse that my beloved friends who are dispensationalists use to prove the rapture or the secret coming of Jesus to catch up his saints. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. This is the expression from which comes the word, the rapture. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The Bible says that when Jesus comes back, the saints of God are going to be caught up and the saints of God are going to be raptured. Therefore, I believe in the biblical concept of the rapture. But I do not believe in the secret rapture. What is the doctrine of the secret rapture and what does it teach? Let me illustrate. Perhaps you're driving along the Ventura Freeway, one of the busiest freeways in the world. And all of a sudden, you see cars careering off the freeway. And cars are crashing because the drivers, or at least some of the drivers, have been raptured. They've been caught up and taken home to be with Christ in glory. This idea is believed today possibly by the majority of Christians in North America. It is taught by some of the most wonderful Christians who call themselves dispensationalists. And so it is believed that Jesus comes in secret and the saints of God are mysteriously and secret, secretly raptured home to glory. You can imagine a great church service. Maybe it occurs on a Sabbath morning or maybe a Sunday morning. I don't know. And the preacher is preaching and he's preaching a strong sermon and all of a sudden people in the church just disappear. But the preacher preaches on. <laughs> But that is the idea of the rapture. But I want you to notice this verse again because this verse does not seem, in my judgment, to talk about a secret rapture. Would you notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 again, please, if you don't mind. The Bible says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a what? Well, it says here, don't know what Bible you got there, Helen. But mine says, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. One man has said, this verse that teaches the secret rapture is the noisiest verse in the Bible. Now, you know, I just may be a little dumb, but I would find it pretty hard to find the secret rapture in that text. The Lord himself comes back. He comes back with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and there's, there, there are the trumpets of God playing. And more than this, the cemeteries become the scene of intense activities. Cemeteries everywhere explode because people get up out of the graves and they're, well, they're not walking around, they're caught up. I would suggest that if this text teaches anything, it tells us that when Jesus comes back and when the rapture occurs, every person on the face of the earth is going to know about it. Therefore, I cannot believe in the doctrine that is taught by some of the best Christians that is called the secret rapture or the doctrine of dispensationalism. Now, let me come to the blackboard and give you just uh, a summary of the idea of the rapture that is taught by some of the great scholars in the world. 
Uh, one of the greatest scholars lived in the last century, and his name was Schofield, and he really became the father of dispensationalism. Now, dispensationalism is a new idea. It was never believed by the Protestant reformers. It was never believed by the early Christians. It has never been believed uh, by the universal church. It is a new idea. And as I told the people on Tuesday night, it, uh, if, if it is true, it is rarely new. And if it is new, it is rarely true. Now you say to me, but this Sabbath-keeping business is a very new idea. If it is new, it is rarely true. If it is true, it is rarely new. And you say, this Sabbath-keeping business is a very new thing. No, it is not. It is as old as the world. But the doctrine of the secret rapture is new. Therefore, I do not think on the whole it could be true. Now, when I talk about these people who believe in the rapture, do not think for one moment that I'm talking about them per se. I'm talking about their ideas because some of the finest Christians in the world are dispensationalists. So we're not here today to criticize dispensationalists, but we are here today to say, what does the Bible teach about this idea? So let me come over here to the blackboard and let me give you just a tiny summary of the ideas as held by dispensationalists. Every person here in this great church knows about the doctrine of the 70 weeks. You all know about it, don't you? Daniel 9 talks about the 70 weeks. God said in Daniel 9, verse 24 and 25, 70 weeks are determined upon your people, upon the Jews, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to set up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The 70 weeks is divided into a number of sections. You have seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and then you have the last week. And so you have the 483 years, and the Bible says, from the going forth of the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, there will be 483 days, or 483 years. And we believe that this time period started in 457 and that Jesus came as the Messiah in 27 AD. And so you have the, the 70 weeks and it's divided up into 7 weeks and 62 weeks. And then you have the coming of the Messiah. And what dispensationists do, God bless them, is that they take this and they say this refers to what happened when Jesus came, but then you have the Christian era of some 2,000 years and the last week is taken from the 70 weeks and it is brought over here to the very last days. And so you have the 69 weeks back here in the days of Jesus and you have the last week or seven years that occur right at the very end of time. I find this very, very hard to believe because there is nothing in the Bible that says that the, the last week should be separated from the 69 weeks. The Bible says 70 weeks, 70 weeks. And therefore, I believe that we ought to put the 70 weeks together. But dispensationists say, no, you've got the 69 weeks back here. And because this refers to the Jews, the Christian era can't be taken into our, into our calculations. And the last week is when everything is really going to occur. Now, when I talk about the views of dispensationalists, I should point this out to you. The views of dispensationalists somewhat vary. And therefore, uh, when I mention uh, people like Hal Lindsay and so forth, uh, whom I appreciate as, as wonderful Christians, I, 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 I need you to know that not every dispensationalist believes the same. So I'm trying to give you a summary of the main beliefs of the most influential dispensationalists. And Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, which is fully dispensationalism, is the biggest selling book ever in North America, outside the Bible. It has influenced Christians more than anybody else, and therefore, as far as this truth is concerned, I stand very much as a minority. And so here they have the 69 weeks, and then they have the last week, and somewhere here, many say right here, the rapture takes place. And so the rapture takes place, it is a secret thing, and all of a sudden 
the good people of, uh, and the saints are gone home to heaven and the rest are rest upon the, uh, are left upon this earth. Then comes the Antichrist and he rules for 1260 days. The Antichrist certainly is not a person who uh, fulfilled the prophecies in the Dark Ages. This, you see, is not historicism. But the Antichrist is a person still to come right down to the very end of time. And the Antichrist comes and he rules for three and a half years. Now when it says in Daniel 9 that he makes, he rules for three and a half years and he does this work, we believe that it's talking about Jesus in his ministry for the three and a half years. They say no, it's not talking about Christ, it's talking about Antichrist. And so it's the Antichrist right down at the end of time. And he makes a covenant with the Jews, the people of God. And after three and a half years, he brings to an end the sacrifice and the oblation. We believe that refers to the cross. They say, no, this doesn't refer to the cross. This refers to the Jewish sacrifices being stopped in the Jewish temple. And therefore, these dearly beloved brethren in Christ believe that the Jewish temple is going to be rebuilt. That is why all eyes are on Israel. Because the most important thing that's happening in the world today is not the preaching of the gospel, it is what's happening in Israel. The return of the Jews to Palestine. And they believe that the temple is going to be rebuilt. And already Christians and Jews have united together to actually rebuild the temple. Did you know this? Did you know that the, the, the altar and all of those things, they're already made. They're already made and they're finished, waiting to go into a restored temple. Uh, they've even contracted with a farmer in Missouri to supply red heifers so that the sacrificial system can be set up again in the temple. And so sacrifices will be taking place in the temple and then the Antichrist will break his covenant with the Jews and he'll bring an end to the sacrifices and the burnt offerings. And then all hell breaks forth upon the, uh, upon the world and the great time of trouble comes upon the church. Not the church because the church is in heaven. It comes upon the world and upon the Jewish people. And then hell reigns upon the earth. But God raises up not a Christian remnant, but a Jewish remnant. Now the remnant church occurs. The remnant church comes into being and goes out into the world and preaches not the gospel of the cross, but the gospel of the kingdom. And more people are one to the gospel of the kingdom through the preaching of this Jewish remnant than happen all through the 2,000 years of Christendom. And so the great work of the preaching of the gospel doesn't take place in this era, it takes place after the rapture. And then the Russians come down from the north, the Antichrist. The Russians come down from the north and they join forces uh, with other heathen powers in the world and the Americans come to help the Jews. And there's a bloodbath over there in Palestine. And then Jesus comes back with the saints and sets up his kingdom on the earth. It is a wonderful, wonderful doctrine. As far as I'm concerned, and I say this in Christian charity, it is a wonderful doctrine. If you preach it, people will get excited. That's why people got excited with what was going over, uh, over in the Middle East during the Gulf War. They said, this is a part of what's going to happen. The Russians are going to come down soon. This is why all the television evangelists were hyped up over this. There's only one big problem with the doctrine of the secret rapture and all of these things. It is a wonderful idea. It is great preaching. It is exciting, but it's not taught in the Bible. Otherwise, it's a good idea. Now, while there may be variations on the theme with dispensationalism, there are some common beliefs that are held by all. Number one, the rapture is secret. Number two, the church of the true believers is caught up before the great tribulation. Everybody is caught up, you see. This is also a wonderful idea because it says we're not going to have any trouble. We're all going to be caught up and we're going to go home to glory. Hallelujah. You see, live it up. If you become a Christian, you're going to be saved any trouble. And so the church is caught up 
and the church does not go through the great tribulation. If it is so, I say hallelujah because I get enough tribulation as it is. Now let me tell you folks something. If it is true, let us rejoice. But if it is not true, and if you believe it, you may not make the preparation you need to make, and you may miss out when Jesus truly comes. Now, I want you to come to Matthew 24 and verse 21 and onwards, please. Matthew 24 and verse 21 and onwards. Matthew 24 and verse 21 and onwards. It is page 701, and I want you to read the text. Please uh, look up the text, if you don't mind. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And we say this not altogether facetiously. We guarantee the salvation only of those souls who turn up their Bibles. Those of you who just come to listen may not get, you may not make it. We want you to read it in the Bible. Matthew 24, verse 21 and onwards. For then there'll be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So this text tells me the elect are going to be here when the time of trouble is on. But dispensationists say, that's not the Christians, that talk, that's talking about Jews. But the elect in the Bible are those people who belong to every nation under heaven, not just the Jews, you see. So the elect are God's people. For the, sake of the, uh, for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I've told you ahead of time, so if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out, or here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It doesn't sound secret to me, friend. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Now notice these words. Immediately, after the distress of those days, after... The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. After, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Listen. Listen carefully. God's elect, God's children are gathered. God's people are caught up after the great time of trouble. It, it's, it's, it's so plain. What can a person say about this? The Bible says there is going to come a great time of trouble. Look at this on the blackboard. Let me get a piece of chalk. The Bible says, so this goes back to the days of, of Jesus, and so we, we won't worry about this now. But the Bible says there comes the great tribulation, the great tribulation. And the Bible says, after that tribulation, the stars are going to be darkened, the moon won't give us light, and, and then the Bible says uh, they're going to look up and they're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And then he's going to send his angels and they're going to gather the elect. That is the rapture. The gathering of God's people is the rapture. And so in the Bible, we're told very, very plainly by, by Jesus Christ our Lord, that the great tribulation precedes the rapture or the gathering of the saints of God together. And during this time of the great tribulation, the Bible says the Antichrist is going to rule the world. Does it matter what one believes? Listen carefully. I believe the Bible teaches that the church on earth, the church is on earth 
during the great deception. If this is so, it is necessary for the church to prepare for the great deception. If the church is in heaven, then don't worry about it. But if the church is on the earth during the reign of the Antichrist, during the great tribulation, then it is necessary for the church of God today to prepare for what is coming. Therefore, I say today, we should expect tribulation. We believe that a great conflict is coming and you and I today need to become strong in God. So this is not a popular doctrine. Become a Christian and God will bless you and you'll become tremendously wealthy. And then before the fireworks start, God is going to come and catch you home to glory. You know, when Russians hear this doctrine taught that the church doesn't go through tribulation and they know it is taught by the majority of Americans, it leaves a very sour taste in their mouth. They say, what sort of God is this? That we've lost 70 million people in 70 years, but the church in America and the rest of the world is going to be raptured home without any trouble. What a doctrine. It's not the doctrine of strong men. Jesus spoke about the wise man who built his house on the rock. Would you come to Matthew 7? Matthew 7. And please come to verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus talks about the last days. Matthew 7. Uh, verse 24 to 27, page 686. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who's built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The winds came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I want to tell every person here listening today, you're listening to me, I want you to know this, there's a storm coming. You know that? There's a flood coming. The rain's going to come down. It's going to beat upon your house. Don't think that you're going to be safe in glory strumming a, a harp. Don't think you're just going to be raptured home. No, the Bible says there's a storm coming. Your house is going to be rattled. The rain's going to come. The storm's going to come. The wind's going to blow. And if your house is built on the sand, it's going to go. I say, build your house on the rock. Amen. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Get ready for the great time of trouble that is coming. Why do you think I pour out my heart to you and say to you, read the Bible? I say to every person I baptize, some listen and some do not listen. Because of the perversity of human nature, we always think we can do better on our own. I say to every person I baptize, to every person to whom I preach the word, I say, read the Bible. Read it every day. Get your Bible out. Read the Word. Pray. Jesus said, it is written. Cut down on the trashy television. 90% of it is garbage. 90% of it is garbage, and that's being kind. Most of the movies that come out, garbage, filth, garbage. Most of the people who put out the movies have got minds that are perverted. Not all of them, most of them. You know it's true. The book, Hollywood Against America. Every person ought to believe it. Americans and people in the Western world are being brainwashed by the most insidious teachings. And some of us today can go and look at movies that 10, 20 years ago you would have called pornographic. And the church would have disfellowshipped you if you'd gone to those things. But today, we don't care. 
On the whole, we don't care. I want to tell you there's a storm coming and we're not going to be raptured home before it comes and you and I better get ready. And we need to build our house on the rock, on the Lord Jesus Christ and on his words. That's the difference. That's the difference. How will Jesus return? How is he going to return? Oh, this is a good subject. Come to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 for a start. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, it tells us how Jesus is going to return. Revelation chapter 1 and it's verse 7 in the Bible. Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Look, he is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The Bible said he's he's coming with the clouds and every person on the face of the earth is going to see him. My friend, the coming of Jesus is not going to be a secret, mysterious event. It is going to be the most glorious and the most visible event in the history of the world. We're going to see him. As Jesus ascended after his crucifixion, the angels stood there and they said, You men of Galilee, Why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. How did he go? Did he go as a spirit? He went away as a man who could eat fish. Jesus said, handle me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see that I have. He didn't go up as a spirit. He's not coming back as a spirit. He's going to come back this same Jesus. And the Bible says, when the Son of Man shall sit on his glorious throne. And the Bible said, with all the holy angels, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back, not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but as King of kings and Lord of lords in tremendous glory. Don't tell me it's going to be a secret thing. Oh, these people say, but he comes back after here. So you've got this coming and you've got this coming and seven years or so apart, The Bible nowhere splits up the second coming of Jesus. He's coming back in glory. Every person is going to see him when he comes. He's coming back personally, visibly, literally, gloriously with the angels in the clouds of heaven. And before he comes, there's coming a time of trouble. So build your house on the truth. You know why I get a little, what should I say? I'm trying to make it sound nice for myself. I was going to say impatient, but I would never get impatient. (laughs) Exasperated. Mm -hmm. My mother said to me time after time, John, take the text, thou hast need of patience. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I should, I guess, because I am your son. Um, Listen. Just listen to this. We live in the valley of the blind. I preached a sermon on this. Do not think that Christianity as it exists in this part of the world is normative Christianity. Most of it is a sham. And most people who profess to be followers of Christ are shams. It's the truth. And you and I are in danger of thinking that what is normative in Southern California and in America and in Australia is normative Christianity. It's not. It's a sham. Did you know they've done surveys? The Gallup poll carried out a survey, Stephen, and Christians in this great country have exactly the same rate of crime as anybody else. The same murders, the same rapes, exactly the same in the church as in the world. Don't tell me that that's what I ought to be. Because I don't want to be it. I don't want you to be it. I want to be God's person. Don't you? And I say to you, build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a comfort to you. Let me give you a comfort. If you don't like the plain teaching of the Bible, here is the comfort. There are plenty of churches you can go where you can get plenty of twaddle. 
There are plenty of churches where you can get a smooth gospel and let me tell you that you and those preachers will end up together in hell. Jesus is going to come. He's going to raise the dead. But before the church is resurrected, there is a time of trouble coming for the church. And Jesus said the wind is going to come and the rain is going to come and the lightning is going to flash and there's going to be an earthquake thrown in too. And Jesus said, the people who build upon the rock are going to be okay. What are the last great events? Well, this is enough for eight sermons. Let me give it to you in a few minutes. Number one, the preaching of the gospel. Matthew 24, verses 9 and onwards. Matthew 24, verses 9 and onwards. Matthew 24, verse 9 and onwards. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. It's preached before Jesus comes. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And then he goes on and talks about what people will need to do. The Bible says before the second coming, before the rapture, the antichrist, the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place The Bible says there comes a time of trouble. And the Bible says at the same time, the gospel goes to the whole wide world. You listen to me. There'll be no sold souls saved after the rapture. There'll be no preaching after Jesus catches up his people. If you're going to be saved... You better get saved now. Hmm. The Bible tells us that there comes a reign of terror that I wish I need not even mention. And when I talk here about the preaching of the gospel, I mean the preaching of a blood-red gospel. I mean a gospel that talks about a bleeding Christ. I mean a gospel that says you can be saved through the blood of the atonement, not by the works of your attainment. Revelation 14, you know the passage, it talks about the three angels' messages that goes to the whole wide world. And then the great prophecies of Revelation 13 are fulfilled that talk about the beast, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, This idea says the beast, the image, the mark of the beast that occurs after the rapture is all tied up with the Jews. It's tied up with a revived Holy Roman Empire. But the saints are home in glory. But the Bible says, don't you be fooled. The church of the living God is going to confront the Antichrist. They're going to see the seas turn to the blood of a dead man when the seven last plagues are poured out when intercession ceases, as is taught in Revelation chapter 15, when the door of mercy closes for the human race. And then God calls out a remnant, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17, which will ultimately be fulfilled during the last great conflict. Revelation 12, verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, the church, went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. You say to me, who is this remnant? Well, my beloved friends who are dispensationalists say, 
Well, that's a remnant of Jews. That's why they keep the commandments. Because Christians don't need to do that. They don't need to keep the Sabbath or the Ten Commandments. So they've got to be a, a group of Jews. I want to tell you, they are a group of Jews, spiritual Jews. I believe that the Israel of God today is made up of Arabs and Jews and Americans and Russians and Australians and Spanish and Croatians, all of those people who have been saved by the blood of Christ. That's the Israel of God. And during the time of the Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist is persecuting, that's when the true remnant of God is going to be revealed. And God says, here they are, they keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. And the Bible tells me in Revelation 7, they are sealed with the seal of God in their foreheads, and they are made eternally secure. I ought to have a bunch of charts that I can drop down to illustrate these things. So the two viewpoints are miles apart. This is a great idea. It's held by some great, wonderful Christians, far better than I'll ever be. But that's all you can say for it. This is God's idea. It's taught in the Bible. And the Bible says that after the gospel has been preached in all the world, after the Antichrist has done his best and his worst, after the great tribulation, after the sealing of the saints, after the seven last plagues, after the la last great message to the world, after the close of probation, the Bible says, Jesus comes. The resurrection takes place. And those who have survived the Holocaust are caught up in the clouds. And Paul says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the truth, I believe, of the Bible. What must I do? Number one, believe in, rely upon Jesus for salvation. There's only one way you can be saved. That's by grace. Number two, build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ Build your faith upon the rock. Don't look at people. Don't look at the church. The church is faulty because it's made up of faulty people like you and me. But look to Christ. Build your faith upon the Word of God. A person whom we value greatly wrote these words. Only those who fortified their minds with the truths of God's word, will stand through the last great conflict. Amen. I call you today, whether you like it or not, I call you today not to a superficial Christianity, not to the Christianity of marshmallows that's got sugar inside and sugar outside, and all it'll do is put up your sugar. I don't call you to that. You and I need to develop a Christianity that is transparently honest. In Australia, we call it dinky dye. Genuine, true blue, fair dinkum. That is not a put on. You see. Because you may love the minister who tells you you can do what you like, but you won't love him a lot when you're both burning together. Is that true? Is it true? It is the truth. And you and I need to believe it and follow it. And so, we got a glory today. Hallelujah. <laughs> These great events are going to take place. Jesus is going to come. He's going to have a people. 
They're going to be as true to duty as the needle to the pole. They're going to be justified by the blood of the Lamb and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. They're going to be people who are people of one book, as John Wesley said. He said, here is the book. At any cost, give me the book of God. I want to make this book the guiding factor in my life. I want to read it every day, and I want to be ready when Jesus comes. So please bow your heads. We want to thank you, God, that your word is true, it is clear, it is simple, it is plain. It shows us what we ought to do. Now, Father, we just pray that you'll bless all those who believe in dispensationalism because we know that you've got some of the most glorious Christians among them, better than we'll ever be. But help us to know that just because we're good people, it doesn't mean that our theology is right. Help us to build our theology and our belief upon what God says. Help us not to follow a religion which is a delusion that says, well, get baptized, join the church, and then everything's going to be dandy. You're just going to be carried home on a, a feather cushion. Help us to know, our Father, that we are called to be soldiers of the cross and to bleed for the Lord. And help us to know that a storm is coming. The wind is going to come. The rain is going to come. The lightning is going to flash across the sky. The earth is going to quake. And only those who built their faith upon the words of Christ will stand in that day while those who built upon the sand of human philosophy and ingenuity and conniving and church politicking will be swept away. Our Father, today we come to you as a congregation and we tell you this, we accept you as our Savior. We ask you to come into our hearts and forgive us for our sins. None of us, Lord, are worthy of your mercy. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive me personally for my sins the time I get impatient. Wash me in the blood of Christ. Cleanse me from all iniquity. Search me and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Bless the congregation that this congregation will be a congregation that loves you and follows you and obeys your word, and at last is raptured, caught up to be with Christ in glory. Bless every person here today. Hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake, amen.